Today we're going to be talking about file loops. So this is a very technical presentation of what NetFuture IP table can do, where does it fit in the landscape, and how we use them, how we're going to use them at Aweber. Uh, the goal is also to explain a bit how the new firewall in uh, Chef is going to be working and how it will impact uh, development and uh, the, the whole platform in general so that if you have a problem at some point trying to connect to a service and you can't, at least you know where to look and kind of have an idea how to debug it. Um, so we're going to talk about that part I mean, a little bit later because I want to talk about some <coughs> geekiness, we call it. Uh, firewalls are really cool. Uh, if you read my email this morning, this is one of the most exciting to me at this most exciting technology. Um, it's really cool technology because you get control over the very, what I call the atoms of the internet, the packets. You can, it's pretty much the only place where you can look into a packet and apply filters on it, and once it gets past the firewall, you don't have any control over it from your application perspective, or you see is data coming up in a socket, and you don't know how it was transmitted, what kind of packet it was, if it was a legitimate packet, if it wasn't a legitimate packet, what was its origin, all of that disappears. Um, so firewalls are cool, and, and I don't even know that, so they put firewalls everywhere. Uh, like this one, this two was from Matrix, and this one is uh, when Trinity does an MAP command to SSH to and shut down the half of the city in like second and a half. Uh, there's a movie called Firewall with Harrison Ford. Anybody watch it? I don't think it's any good, but <laughs> <laughs> it's called Firewall, so it had to be here. Uh, Firewalls everywhere, like every single time. I was watching uh, Mission Impossible. Mission Impossible on Sunday evening actually, and, and they're stuck in, in a hotel room, and the geek guy goes like, oh, I can't break through the four layers of military grade firewalls. You have to climb out the building. And he puts his gloves on and starts climbing out the building because he can't go through the firewalls. So firewalls are cool. Uh, it's always sec associated with sexy network technologies. Uh, and we can do some very, very cool stuff with it. This is a video that uh, actually Mike sent me uh, a couple of weeks ago about to watch it very quick. NICT has developed DDoS, a cyber attack alert system. DDoS renders attacks on networks visible in real time. The sphere in the center represents the internet, and the circles moving around it represent networks under observation. The state of an attack is shown using 3D graphics and can be viewed from any perspective. The connections and packets. If you, if you watch Ghost in, in the Shell, this is kind of what they use. So, 190,000 IP addresses are very small. We have 4 billion addresses in the IP Including a spread of mail. Well, I guess. We'll stop it here. <laughs> yeah, firewall. Probably QoS on the firewall. <laughs> Probably. You should check that. Anyway, firewalls are cool. Where um, the USB memory sticks <laughs> as well as zero day exploits. Thank you very much. So you seem to. One day we'll have something like that in the game room with a Kinect and Steve Switch. Good connections. That'd be good. <laughs> Um, firewall is also desperately needed. The reason why um, engineers started building features for packets is that that thing didn't exist in the first version of the internet. And um, one of the first really important uh, network-based attack that was revealed was actually documented in 1989 and used by Kevin Mitnick, you probably heard of him, in 1994. And what it did is that it broke into uh, a SunSpark station by injecting TCP packets. And what it did is that the this, this, this Spark client here had a trust relationship with the server that was based on the IP address. So the Spark client would accept everything coming from the server. So Mitnick took down the server by DDoSing it. Um, injecting SIM packets so the server could not respond to anything anymore, 
And during that time, Mitnick was injecting, spoofing the IP of the server to inject packets here into the client. The client stopped the packets were coming from the server, accepted the packets, except that the payload of one of the packets was accept connections to your terminal from anywhere. Packet got accepted, configuration of the client got updated, and from there on, Mitnick had full access to the, to the client and used it to download code and all of that. And the researcher who owned that network, um, Tsutomu Shimomura, um, actually had the FBI track down and put Mitnick uh, into jail. Uh, but that first, that attack, the very interesting thing is that Shimomura had TCP dump running continuously on his network. So when he analyzed what happened, he took the dump of the traffic and and so that Mitnick was actually injecting packet and how it was doing it. That was the first documented um, analysis that we have of this attack. And this is when people realized we can't just base uh, authentication on the IP addresses because it can be spoofed. So we have other workarounds to prevent that kind of attack today by randomizing sequence numbers and everything. But people started thinking that we needed a way to firewall those networks and accept packets only from a specific interface or a specific source and not only from everywhere. So this is when firewall started to develop. So the first version of firewall were not uh, whitelist based, they were blacklist based. So we would accept everything and drop a certain amount of networks, like, hey, I'm going to drop everything from China. So obviously that's not optimal. Uh, now we do a lot better. Um, so firewalls are, by definition, packet based. We have no notion of connection in a firewall uh, when we apply a filter to a firewall. Uh, when a packet enters a system, so this is probably horrible to read, but <laughs> there's no way to make it less. It needs to be accurate. Um, this is the Ethernet uh, frame. The IP packet is inside the data field of the Ethernet frame. And then you have the TCP packet that's itself inside the IP here. So all of that is bedded together in one long string. And then after the TCP packet, you have the data. So the system receives a packet. The packet arrives into the network card. The driver of the network card is going to process the most basic control, MAC address, that kind of stuff, what it can do. And then the system has to take care of it. How Linux does it, Linux was used, we use a, a C structure called skbuff and parse the packet and all of the fields of the packet into the C structure. So the structure is a lot longer than this, but this is just some, some of the fields. This is structure made up of the structures and it's uh, a linked structure, so you have each packet that is linked to the next one and the previous one. Uh, the socket that the packet is attached to, the network, the Naked trace, some information about contract, and here you see for this specific packet, you have a pointer to the transport headers, whether it's TCP, UDP, network headers, that's IP, the MAC headers, MAC, source MAC, destination MAC. So the Linux kernel, the first thing it does is take the data from the driver of the network interface and parse that into that big SKBox structure. And that structure is going to be used by every single uh, function of the net code of the Linux kernel. So instead of moving the data around, we just move the pointer to the structure. What the firewall of Linux does is apply filters to this structure. It looks at the different fields and say, hey, do I want to accept this field? Do I want to drop this field? And if we decide to drop, we're just going to drop the whole structure, destroy it. So this is how Linux applies it. Now, the net code of the Linux kernel is a pretty huge piece of software. It's pretty important. Um, and it would be unrealistic to just have all the filters applied at the same location. So net filter uses a model made of chains like that. Um, each of those chains are five by default. Uh, I apply a different point of the path of a packet. This is the same version of the diagram a little later. Uh, we'll discuss the more complex one. Uh, 
What happens is that the packet enters, gets parsed, goes into pre-routing. That's before the system decides if the packet is for itself or if the packet should be routed to another machine in the case the Linux system is acting as a router. Uh, if the packet is for the system itself, see, I'm running a web server, I receive a packet to port 80 myself, then I'm going to send it to the web server. So the packet is going to go up into the input chain. And from there, it's going to go up to the socket, where the application will read it from the socket. If the packet is not for the system itself, it will be routed through the forward chain and then sent to pass routing where post-processing is, is done and sent back to the wire. Um, so this is the ingress pass. Wow. Okay. Um, if the web server writes a packet, writes a, an answer or something, the packet goes through the socket, it's written to the socket, goes through the output chain, cross-routing wire. This is very easy to comprehend. Um, we can place different types of rules on different chains. Usually, we put most of the filtering rules on input and output. And in the case of a router or a periphery firewall, we put them in forward. So, at just a basic organization, all of those chains live in um, pretty much the IP, TCP layers of the kernel. That just hooks through the uh, IP functions, TCP functions. So basic use of this um, IP tables 101, you probably can really familiar with that. The most basic usage is stateless firewall. I'm not following, not tracking anything, I'm just applying rules to all of the packets that have uh, destination port 80 or source port 80, so that goes up to the web server, down from the web server, I accept the ingress packet, I accept the egress packet. Very basic use. If you've played with NetFilter and IP tables before, you probably did that. Stateful version, a little more complex. So the difference is that we're coding the contract module. Um, you've probably used the state module, uh, dash m state. They do the same thing. Uh, contract is more modern and use the new. Um, module interface of NetFilter, the XT uh, interface, and contract can match uh, on more different states than the state module can. Well, the unreplied state, uh, the, all of the invalid states that the uh, initial state module didn't have. Uh, so what will it, this will do is, if the firewall receives a packet, and we look at the packet, we relate it to an existing connection in the kernel, and we see that we already got uh, packets in this connection before, like a TCP handshake. That was valid, so we move the connection to established state. Then the subsequent packets are just going to be accepted. We don't check their port or anything, we just look at them and like, all right, you belong to a connection that we already authorized and we already considered valid, so go ahead. The second rule is the one that would apply to um, every single packet that initiates a new connection. That's a new city state here. So if a web browser connects to a web server, web browser is going to send a TCP sync packet. The first, the TCP sync packet reaches the server, and that TCP sync packet is going to be in states new, because we don't have a connection for it yet. Um, so in that mode, and uh, feature IP tables, um, you're going to look at the state of a connection and decide if, depending on the state, if they should be accepted or not. The advantage of that is, uh, in a typical TCP connection, if you just do a get slash um, on a small resource and you don't have a lot of data going through, you have three packets for the TCP handshake. Then the, the push from the web browser, the response from the web server, and four packets for closing the TCP connection. So that's nine packets just to do a get slash and get up for, for whatever. Out of those nine packets, only the first one will be matched by uh, the city state new, and all of the others will fall under this one. So it's more efficient. Uh, logging. 
So if you want to know what kind of packets are coming through, you can just apply the same type of filter. And this is going to send a log line to the local uh, syslog configuration. So that goes through your syslog and you can sort it in different files, all of that stuff. Um, logging can be extremely variable. We get a lot, lot, lot of packets everywhere in the system that represent a lot of volume. It's not always easy to go through. So there are demons to help with that. Uh, you log and the stuff. Yep. Does that would that uh, would that rule right there result in an accept or a drop though, or do you need another line to say what to do with it? This one? Yeah. So yeah. So you, the other one say dash j accept or 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 you know and there's dash j drop. But if you do log, does it accept it or not? Log is not a terminal change, so it's not going to do anything with it. It's just going to go to the next rule. You cannot put two targets in the same rule. Right. So um, the the log one will have to be followed with an accept or a drop to do something with it. Um, what we usually do is to uh, direct packets to another chain where the chain, the only thing the chain will do is log it and accept it or drop it so that we divert the packets past so that not everything goes through the same long list. Uh, a little more about stateful and stateless. That's that's rather important. Um, contract is the, the part of the kernel that, that maintains the state of TCP and UDP connections. Um, we've had problems with contract uh, a few weeks ago during the uh, DDoS of the web forms, and the issue was that we were receiving a very very large number of packets. We are not exactly sure what broke at that point. The issue might be that the contract state was not updated fast enough and we were depleting the contract bucket, so uh, new connections were dropped. The point is, contract is extremely interesting from a security standpoint, but can be expensive. On systems like the memcache one through four, um, I was checking last night around I don't know, 10 p.m., something like that, and the system was processing about 12,000 packets per second. Um, and I think the average is around three to 400 connections, full connections per second. That's a lot of packets, a lot of them. Um, contract can maintain state for every single one of those connections, but it needs to be configured properly. So if you're building like a high scale system, make sure you have that set up right. Uh, contract is very useful to follow the state of connection directly by reading ProcNet IP contract. So if, if you're working on a system and you're having trouble enabling connections, you can just grab for whatever source IP, destination IP you have, anything, into this file, and you get a string like that. Now, the string contains the established state that the Netflix state, and the should means that we saw packets in both directions. So the Netfilter state and the contrast state are actually two different things. Established the Netfilter one, assured is a contract one. Um, and the contract module that we saw before can match both. All right. Yes? What's, what's the bottleneck for maintaining the state information? Is that just a context switching problem, or, what's, or is it? It's not like memory or CPU, I would imagine, right? I mean, well, is it just buffering all this state? And so what's the what's the following? It's not buffering, it's in line. So if you if on a packet you want to check the status, the state of a packet, you need to pass it through the contract code and that can potentially take time. So during that time, also packets come in. Um, the connection pool builds up and eventually contract has to clean it up. If it doesn't clean up fast enough, the new packets will not have room to get accepted, they eventually drop. That's the assumption but we didn't really diagnose it down to that point. That's kind of the case that we think happened. So the solution was to um, maintain less, maintain a connection for uh, less time, because the default is five days, but it's supposed to clean them up when it needs new ones. Um, so keep them only for a couple of minutes and accept more of them, because we have enough memory for that. So this is, uh, where was I? Yeah, this is kind of the, the, the simple version of, of, of NetFilter. Uh, I didn't mention that. I use NetFilter more than I use IPTable because NetFilter is, is a kernel code of the, of the firewall. 
IP tables is the interface that writes uh, commands into a netlink socket that is used to communicate with netfilter. So IP tables is more widely used because it's the public facing part of the firewall, but the code that really processes rules is netfilter. Um, that's why usually the, the packet flow here is not IP tables, packet flow is really netfilter. So a simple version of the packet flow, but if you really want to do something serious, you probably want this. So the difference here, I'm sorry, it's not very easy to read from there, but the difference here is that um, every single chain and tables are represented by a single box. So you have five main chains and then several tables. Here's a more easier to read version of it. You have the pre-routing chain, and this pre-routing chain, it also has NAT, NAGLE, and road tables. Now, tables and chains have two different roles. Chains are positioned in the code. At what, le at what level do we apply a rule? Do we do it before we, we decide on the routing decision? Do we do it before um, uh, passing it to the socket? That kind of thing. Tables are more of a functionality representation of what we want to do. Um, for example, if you put a rule in the row table, you do it before anything else is applied to that packet. So we use that, the row table, uh, Jordan used that to uh, deactivate the contract before the packet was actually processed by any of the nested code. That's what we would use a row table for. Uh, Mongol is used to, uh, well, mangle packets. If you want to change something in a packet, you would do it in there. And future, future is a default table. If you add a rule without specifying the dash t something, it will go into future. Because that's what we want to do most of the time, it's future something. Um, this is the same diagram as before, but a lot more useful, because if you want to you know where to place a rule and how it's going to be processed, well, you know here that when it goes out, it goes first to output row, then output mongo, output net, output filter, and then it goes to cross routing. How do you use that? I said I didn't put a lot of caps, but I like to put one. Uh, Mangle connection based on their size, size of a connection as in quantity of data that we saw going through that connection before. Uh, that's actually pretty useful. I use that in uh, QoS traffic control rules so that when a connection transfers more than, um, what did I set it to? 10 megabytes of data, I assign to it a special mark. Uh, and this mark is going to be used into the QoS code to decrease the priority of the connection. So if a connection uses a lot of bandwidth, the, the traffic control layer is going to say, all right, you use a lot of bandwidth, you're obviously not time sensitive. So we're going to let those packets pass before you. So, this does applies a rule to the mango table inside pass routing. Um, what well, should I replace that variable here? It uh, should be is zero. To TCP packets um, for connections that are more than 10 megabytes large. Uh, that's lower limit, and after the column will be upper limit, but since I don't set one device to work from. And this is going to count bytes in both directions, and it's going to send this specific uh, packet to the count mark chain. And the count mark chain is going to be used to apply a mark. So the mark is not applied to the packet per se. If you TCP dump the packet, you're not going to see the mark on it. The mark is applied to the SK buff structure of the packet in the kernel. So the SK buff structure has a, has a value, a mark value, and a count mark value, two of them actually, that is going to contain this thing. And when the packet, when the SK buff is passed after NetFilter, it goes into traffic control. Traffic control is inside the kernel as well. We look at the SK buff structure and look at the mark and say that, all right, you have the mark 999, so you have lower priority. Uh, Mongo packets based on an ASCII string, the payload. That's actually, that's, I guess, another way to restrict access to an admin page is to simply drop the packets, the incoming packets that contains a string get slash admin HTTP 1.1. That would work. Yeah, right. Is that like a more expensive method since you're actually going to be doing some like regular expression matching, essentially? Or? It is expensive, um, but realistically, 
this is less expensive than having the packet go all the way to user land and then to a daemon that is going to, to process it because this is dropped directly into netcode. So the, the packet is parsed inside the SQL structure anyway. All that does is, all right, I have to go look for that string inside the, the payload, which is just a buffer uh, that is accessible through the SK buff. So it is obviously more expensive than just processing this, but it scales pretty well. Um, so yeah, this is, I don't know how useful it is. It depends how you want to uh, lock down your system. But if you don't have a way to, to put ACL somewhere, you can do it this way. And remember the, the Mitnik attack on, um, yeah. So with that, let's say, you know, you had a web server and uh, if you went to admin slash admin, that would expose some admin function. Is that second thing basically what prevents outside users from being able to access that? Yeah, what that, do, what that does is when your web browser is trying to connect to the web server, the packet would have to go through the firewall. Now, the firewall will look into the packet, it's the HTTP packet. Well, the firewall doesn't know it's HTTP, because it doesn't have any notion of HTTP. It knows it's TCP. It looks into it and sees get slash, and it will just drop the packet, not even let the web server know that we just dropped the packet for it. It would just drop it. And when doing that, then the web browser on the other side will continue to try to send packets with get slash admin, and that won't work. So why would, I mean, one obvious reason why you, I think you'd like to do that instead of letting the web server say a 403 forbidden, right? I mean, yep. that's another way to do it, is because this wouldn't, this means web server. the illusion of a non-existent server also for somebody who's just trying to hit whatever's there. Right. The, theoretically, the earlier you can uh, protect your system, the less exposure you have, the more secure you are. Um, if you have a system for any reason that cannot process ACLs and say, I cannot just close the access to that range of IPs, you can use that. Um, most web servers will allow you to put an authentication or something, but if you can't even talk to the web server, then you're even more secure. Um, honestly, I mean, this is more to show the capabilities of NetFilter, but I don't think we would want to use that here because it's kind of, you need a nice way to manage that if you're going to start putting ACLs into the firewall. It's not always. Um, the feature SSH on Christmas, that's actually something I, I, I didn't know about until I started looking through all of the modules in the kernel yesterday. But yeah, you can just um, have NetFuture look at the system date and, and accept or drop a packet based on the time. So typically, the midnight attack was performed on Christmas Day because um, Shimomura wasn't at his desk and working on Christmas Day. So that's a perfect day to attack a system. And typically when we see attacks, we see them more on the weekends or at night when nobody's looking. But if you have a system that is not supposed to be used at night or on the weekends, you can lock it down with a kind of hook. Just say, don't accept any packet. And that's typically the kind of thing you don't really find in web servers. You would have to do that in your application and it's not easy to manage. Well, you can do it in the firewall. I'm going to stop Christmas from coming. Need a hat. Another cool thing uh, in NetFilter is that hooks leave NetFilter queue. Uh, that thing is, uh, I want to say fairly recent, but it's not, it's like 2000. The first version, the NetFilter queue, I think, was released in 2006, probably late 2006, 2007. Um, what that does is it lets you plug a program into the input or forward or output chains. So you can say, all right, I have packets entering here, but before they reach uh, my web server or whatever, I want to divert them to this hook. And on this hook, you're gonna plug uh, a program that you write using the NetFeature Q library to receive the packets and apply whatever logic you want to them and send it back or drop it. So this is useful. Um, I, 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 use that, I use that in a research project um, where we were building honeypot systems. We're just using that to, to get all the packets from uh, 
before it could actually reach a web server and apply some statistics to it and decide to divert them or not. Um, you could use that for security purposes if you want to have all of the traffic that um, a user is going to generate. That could be your application user, like app user. You want to record everything, then you apply a rule like this one, where you match the owner of the socket, the UID owner. Uh, so app user would be something like 1001 or something like that. And you send all of the traffic, the output traffic that this, this system user is creating to the NFQ. And on the NFQ, uh, NFQ recorder is a bit of a program I wrote. It's just, what it does, it just takes the packets from the queue, records it to a PCAP file, uh, prints some packet information, and send it back to the filter. So it's very basic. Um, but that's useful because it puts all of the data recorded into a PCAP file, so you can read it with Wireshark or TCP dump or whatever you want. This is a this diagram, how that works. So the application right to the socket, and here in output you would say, insert my rule, you can put it wherever you want in the rule set, you can put it at the bottom, at the top, in the middle, wherever. And when it reaches that rule, it's going to be sent to the hook, then back, and continue, and you get your file here. So it really diverts, diverts the, the, the pass of the packet. If, if the application here does not re-inject the packet, um, it's going to be lost. That's the difference with TCP dump. Because TCP dump, by default, duplicates the data from the network interface driver. So TCP dump will put here a hook and say, everything that comes into this uh, network interface, give me a copy. So if you're trying to diagnose a firewall issue, a system issue, whatever, on your system, packet centering, um, and you see them in TCP dump, but your firewall, your your web server never sees them. It might be because somewhere on the way, that feature is dropping them. But because TCP dump gets a copy of the packet before it actually goes through the firewall, then you see it here, but you don't see it up there. So hooks are useful because you can use that hook system to test your rule set. Say. I'm in the input chain, I have 400 rules in my input chain, and I want to see if at rule 200, I get my packet or not. So you put your hook at rule 200, send it to the NFQ recorder, and if you see it going through, then it's there, and you can increment like that until you find the rule that's dropping it. That's useful for debugging. Julian. Yep. With uh, Apache rewrite rules, there's the you can put the rewrite log in verbose mode, and it'll tell you the specific rule that an individual web request will match. Is there something comparable for the firewall stuff, where it'll tell you which IP tables a particular packet matches? Um, by default, you when you when you apply a rule to something, it doesn't log. So you need to divert it to a log, to a special chain that's going to log and then apply the rule. So you would have, if you have 400 rules that are doing individual drops, you need to send every single one of them to a new chain and say, all right, you're going to send the packet here, then you log, and then you apply the rule, etc. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of difficult to, to, to really debug. Um, by default, let's uh, do and they don't follow these two different things. And actually, one of the main, um, usually, comment with IP table is that you can only have one target rule. So if you do a dash j log, you can put a dash j accept in the same rule, you need to create another one. That makes it a lot more complicated. Packet feature allows to log and accept in the same rule. So there have been attempts to, to change, uh, to replace IP table with something else. Uh, a few years ago, there was an attempt to rewrite that, call it NF table. Um, that was, I think, back in 2008 or 2009. I'm still waiting for the beta version, so if that's not happening. All right, another very cool and very unknown feature, not of IP table this time, of it's called IP sets. Um, what this does is, if you have a huge blacklist or a huge set of files of uh, IP addresses, networks you want to match on, you want to drop on, then you end up having usually one rule per network block or one rule per IP, which one very easily get up to a few thousand rules if you're 
like an internet service provider and your firewall is sitting in the middle of the network. So this is extremely expensive. And the firewall is going to process every single one of those rules one after the other. So it doesn't scale. Better way to do that is to use IP sets. So what IP sets does is it creates a hash um, using algorithm Jenkins tree. So if you look it up like pretty nifty. Um, so it's a constant time hash, and it would put every single IP in there. Uh, so you create a set, you have your, your IPs. Let's say, I'm gonna show you an example with, with uh, China, we can, an example with this, spamhouse.org slash drop is uh, don't root or peer. It's a list of network that um, ISPs and the organization in general should not uh, accept and should not process process packets for. There's usually botnets and all that stuff. So what we can do is take this list, there's a few hundred entries in there, and every single one is uh, network slash something, uh, CID or annotation. Take all of those IPs, create the set called hash name that I forgot to define somewhere. I uh, was editing my script. Let's call it blacklist. So I'm gonna create the hash called blacklist. A net hash. And every single IP is going to go be inserted into, or drop list, that's how I call it, is going to be inserted into that drop list. Then I tell the firewall net filter when packets enter to check the set called drop list. And net filter is going to send the packet to IP set, and IP set is going to take the packet, take the IP that it wants to check, and use the hash to actually verify if it's, if it's in the list. If it is, it's going to return, all right, yeah, you want to drop that. So it's a lot faster and a lot more efficient. Um, another cool thing you can do with that, and I actually tested that this morning, um, I got a list of, thank you for having that, uh, a list of uh, net blocks per country. So you can get, I don't know how accurate that is, but it gives a rough idea of where packets are coming from. Uh, you can get all of the networks from China. There's about, I think, something like three to four thousand uh, net blocks, and every single one of them can be loaded into hash of China, for example. And then every single packet entering the system will be checked against that hash. I tried with um, this little script just about that to give you the list of CID or files that you want. It loads it into a hash of the same name and create the rule to actually send packets to it. So. You can check after that. This this actually doesn't do anything. It will not drop the packet or anything. We just account for it. Say, all right, I got a packet from China, and let it go. Continue its role. That's what the return is doing here. And you can account where your traffic is coming from just by using that filter like that. And it's very efficient. It doesn't cost a lot. And that's a lot more efficient than having a script that parses your web logs and try to geolocate that. And all right. A few other things before we move to uh, AFW. If you've used, uh, if you've written firewall rules before, you've probably written a bash script. Uh, this is fine for a small amount of rules, but if you have a real, with a lot of rules, real firewall, um, it's very expensive to actually reload all those rules every single time. Um, so you should use IP tables restore. Because IP table restore is going to take your rule set, loads it into a uh, structure in the kernel, and once the structure is completely loaded, it's going to swap the pointer from the current rule set with the new one. And that's an atomic operation. You don't you just move it. And it's a lot faster and a lot more efficient than having a script that does IP table add, then IP table add, and IP table add. And this is how it I tried that by creating a, a fake rule set of 62,000 rules. Probably don't want to have that many, but it's just an example. Loading 62,000 rules with IP table restore takes 1.2 seconds. Uh, it's really fast. Doing the same thing with a bash script that does IP table dash A takes 42 minutes. A little bit of a difference here. So, yeah, I'm sorry. I should probably <laughs> do that. So that's um, it for kind of the global tour. Now we're going to talk a little bit about how we do things here. 
uh, AWeber Firewall, AFW, the 90s, early 2000s way of doing firewalls is to have a big first class firewall that sits in front of your network, processes everything, so you pay 50 grand, 100 grand for that magic box and it does everything for you and every single packet that enters your system is magically checked and if it's accepted it can pretty much walk free inside your entire infrastructure because we had a big gate file. This is Mordor gate. Yeah. Big people at the front checking packets. This is great, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work because right now, well, we only have one data center, but hopefully soon enough we'll have two. We're starting to have VMs everywhere. We start new VMs, we crash with VMs, we have staging environment, we have production environments, we have test environment and whatnot. So managing firewall rules for that is pretty much impossible. So we need a better way and something a lot more modern. Here, a node is a VM. And the red circle around the node is the firewall itself. So every single VM is firewall independently. It can behave, it can live anywhere in the network. It doesn't matter because we have a firewall on every single one of them. And that firewall drops everything by default. Everything. And we only accept a very, very small amount of connections. Now, this isn't doable if you have to maintain the firewall rules manually. It will never happen. Eventually, you will have a list of inbound rules that you would accept that says, oh, I'm accepting for port 80, but you will never have outbound rules. You will never be able to say, I want my node to be able to access, uh, I don't know, that was a database over here. Because it's too hard to manage. And, and people have tried, but since I spend their life doing that only and never actually get it completely done, so I have to go back, investigate where to park and everything. So what that does, uh, it's dynamic, it, it evolves automatically. We're trying to keep the rules as accurate as possible and as long as we stay in the, the base infrastructure schema, which is load balancer, API, worker, and then MongoDB, Elastic, Sutra, BDMQ, all of that is predefined. So the, the firewall rules can adapt themselves to the new services. Um, we don't need to rewrite them. When we add new nodes, the downside to that that's more Chef than IP table itself, that the nodes need to converge. So until Chef client actually rerun on every single node, they won't have the new firewall rule to connect to the new guy who just joined the group. Um, I guess that's probably a couple of Chef client runs, so probably one hour max, something like that. Uh, why is for outbound connections per system user? Um, this is something that um, nobody here is used to, and you're probably going to break it shit lot of stuff. It's going to be really fun to enable. Uh, so you won't be able to connect to another service until you have actually a rule for it. I'm trying to make sure that we have all the rules. If you have to look at the, um, the rules, make sure you have one for yourself. They are in Etsy firewall rules.it tables. So they follow the syntax that we just discussed. Uh, and each replace was the same state with a new format contract, but it's the same ID. And the log, all of them. The log in uh, varlog firewall, or with a new fancy central R syslog. So if your system is broke for some reason, you can go to R syslog one and two, or S R syslog one and two, and go to S R V S syslog the date, and look at firewall.log. Something like that, and you will see, for example, you can grab by destination IP or anything, and if you see an input drop or output drop here probably means you're missing a rule for it. Uh, that is, I believe, what I have. This 3D diagram here is taken from uh, the book uh, Linux Network, Understanding Linux uh, Network Internals, I forget the complete name, which is a great, great book if you're interested in too the network layer, if you like reading about C stuff and things like that, it's really good stuff. And this is actually the representation of the NetFilter chains and how they relate to their uh, IP functions counterparts. Uh, fun stuff. That's it. Any question? <laughs> well, that was very clear. That, so, was, that wasn't a question. <laughs> I had a question. 
Yeah. Um, when you load a web page, uh, the response from the web server comes back and it's not port 80, right? You, the, the request is on port 80, but the response is on some port negotiated between your computer and the server. The request is sent from your computer to the server uh, to destination port 80, but the source port is set by your computer before you send the packet. So if, if I go back to, um, let's see what I have here. Uh, probably before that. This guy here. There's a TCP packet here, and that's what your computer is going to send. It sets the destination port here to 80. The source port is going to set to a random value, usually between uh, 32,000, 65,000, anything above 1,000. So your, your computer sends to the server a TCP packet that has destination port 80, source port, uh, I don't know, 30,000. The server, when, when the server replies, is going to send the response to destination port 30,000, source port 80, so it puts it around. Okay, so, so my question is, how does, the, how does my computer know that the source port is not firewall, is, is not in my firewall? Is that done low level by something that's aware? Of of all, the source port gets changed. Okay. It's not what the device is. Can be changed. No, it's just stored in a table. Uh, your computer, if your computer has an outbound firewall, your computer is going to see the packet living going to the web server. Your firewall, your outbound firewall, is going to record that in the connection tracking. And say, I just sent a packet that had destination port 80, so source port 130,000. When the server sends the packet back, the firewall on your computer knows that this is the answer because it saw the previous packet. Okay. That's what connection tracking does. If you don't use, if you use stateless firewall without connection tracking, you need to have a rule that explicitly accepts the packet coming back from web server. So you need to write it manually and say, I accept packet that has source port 80. Because I'm a computer, I'm connecting to web servers. Any other question? All right, this is great. So I hope you enjoy the talk. And next Monday, apparently, we're enabling the new firewall introduction. So if anything breaks, you know how to fix it. That's what I have. <laughs>